hey everybody, how we doing? Thanks for visiting my channel again, Pete Snakebite Kid. What is this thing about Cobra Appreciation Day? Well, I'm gonna tell you. Let's take a look and see if you understand why we need an official Cobra Appreciation Day. Take a look. All right, so this National Cobra Appreciation Day, hear me out. 410, what is that? Obviously, it's Sprint Car Appreciation Day. They're pretty cool cars. Star Wars has its own day. May the 4th be with you. There's those 420 people celebrating Hitler's birthday or something. I don't know what that's all about. Anyway, let's take a look at this. Let's see if I can help you buy into this because the most important hot rod ever built. Okay, sorry about the Batman voice. It's just early in the morning and it comes kind of easy. Anyway, let's talk about this. Let's go through this timeline and see what we can figure out. So here's kind of a timeline of things that happened building up to the moment when there actually was an AC Cobra. And it's interesting. So AC, the car company, it was called Auto Carriers. They called it AC. Started in 1901, a long time ago. First half of the century, they built a lot of stuff. Some really odd, unique looking cars. One of them was a three wheel, almost looked like a, a golf cart thing uh, and so on, but they got cool. In the 50s, they built a thing called an AC Ace. That's what the small block Cobra was actually designed from and so on. And it, of course, grew from there. So they built that AC Ace from 53 to 61. During that time, they used an engine from a company called Bristol. So it was thought of as a AC Bristol engine maker, car maker. So they lost their engine supplier, AC Bristol, in 1961. Now, in the meantime, this dude, Carroll Shelby, wins Le Mans. When you win Le Mans, it's a big deal, but kind of in a big in a small circle kind of thing, where in the endurance racing and Le Mans and things like that, it's a big deal. But let me make a point. If you're watching this, you're probably interested in racing. Quick, name me two other guys that won Le Mans. Eh, time's up. So the point is, it's not the most famous race in the world when it comes to you being famous for the next three years or five years, right? So here he is. He won them all. But the other thing is the doctor said, hey, remember those nitroglycerin tablets I've been giving you? You've been putting under your tongue. You've been racing with them. <sighs> it's time to stop racing. This broke Carol Shelby's heart. Okay, are you with me so far? All right, so AC cars, they lose an engine. Carol Shelby loses a heart. We see any connection there? <laughs> kind of interesting. Anyway, he won that in a Aston Martin DBR1. Let me show you a picture of that. Pretty cool looking car. Okay, so far so good. So he gets to, I won Le Mans, I gotta do something else. He'd been dreaming about building his own car that's got his name on it, and he knew it was gonna be kind of what we call now an engine swap thing. Big engine, little car, go around corner. That's what he was dreaming about building. So, because he has some fame connected to people and so on, he gets a meeting with Lee Iacocca. That meeting is in the big Ford building. It's in spring of 1962. So he had been stumbling around for a couple years, was doing a racing school, got a Goodyear tire distributorship and so on, but he needs the next thing because he's Carroll Shelby and he's a deal maker and he makes stuff happen. So in this meeting, and we've all heard this story to some degree or another, but he told Lee Iacocca, I can build you a car. I can do it for 25,000 bucks and I can beat the Corvette. In America, there was no car that had anything for the Corvette in amateur or professional road racing. Carol Shelby's making a big statement to Lee Iacocca for relatively not a lot of money. I mean, $25,000 was a lot of money back then, but when you think of taking an idea and getting it to the racetrack, that was not a lot of money. Lee Iacocca has an eye for a bargain, thought that was one, and said, you know, the famous one, Get that guy 25,000 bucks, get him a couple engines, get him out of the building before he bites someone. So, okay, so here we are. They've had this meeting where Lee Iacocca and Shelby agreed on that deal. Within six months, that thing's running. This is amazing. So picture going from having an idea, not having money, and there's a car in England to put that all together 
and having a running car within six months. So by October of 62, that car is in Santa Fe Springs, California, and Dean Moon's shop, and Carol and Dean Moon are putting this thing together with one of the 260s that Lee Iacocca gave them. Incredible to make that happen that quick. And then the thing went on to make it happen. But before they could do that, they had to get it into some magazine tests, so they had to paint it. They wanted to paint it a bright color. They decided to mix the brightest color yellow they could come up with, and they did. And the first CSX 2000, their first paint job was yellow. In fact, when you see moon yellow, you're looking at the color they thought of that night. That was the first car painted moon yellow. Kind of interesting. Then it went on to clean house and professional road racing events, amateur road racing events in Southern California and across America and became Cobra the Legend. So here we go. It's happened, right? Now we have an AC Cobra. The timing was pretty crazy. Came together, right place, right time, right car, right engine, right car company. I mean, a lot of stuff had to fall together to make the Cobra the Cobra. Because of that, here's some other stuff that happened. So, you know, we all know Mustang came out in 64. It was actually April 17th when it came out. Uh, that car was a big hit. Uh, everybody knows that. Another thing that happened in 1965, the Cobra won a World Road Racing Championship, FIA Road Racing Championship as a sports car. That's a big deal, right? And Carroll Shelby won it as a manufacturer. No American-made car had ever won that championship. So, big deal. Now, the Daytona Coupe was an AC Cobra reskinned. FIA for that class would let you either do a new suspension or do a different body from the production car to compete in the world championship. They, of course, reskinned it. Uh, Pete Brock came up with that brilliant design of making the car very aerodynamic. It picked up something like 15 miles an hour in top speed and was 25% more fuel efficient. I mean, just magic numbers uh, as far as a race car goes. So that happened in 65. Hey, by the way, that championship was won on July 4th. An English-made car that has a Ford engine in it that actually is produced as an American car, winning a world title on the 4th of July. I just think that's pretty cool. Anyway, next thing, we have this little thing called a big block Cobra. The 427 AC Cobra came out in 1965. It is the most copied car in history. I think that's pretty tough to argue. So, that happened in 65. Lee Iacocca asked Carol Shelby, can we go road racing with that Mustang? Carol Shelby says, that ain't no race car, that's a secretary's car. So he starts talking to SECA, well, what do I need to do to race this? Why does he ask them that? Because Ford offered him money to do it and they knew he was the guy. So the obvious race car stuff, lighten the thing up, put more power in it, make the suspension better, and they fix some suspension geometry and so on. So that was released in January 27th, 1965. So another kind of interesting, kind of important thing happens about now is Ford wins Le Mans in 1966. In June of 66, they won the 24-hour of Le Mans. They went one, two, three. If you saw the movie Ford versus Ferrari, you saw it, you know what happened. If you read the book, Go Like Hell, or if you want to understand the movie better, read that book. It is fact-packed. You will love it. It will make the movie make a lot more sense. You will better understand why I feel obligated to say that every time I talk about this. Ken Miles was absolutely instrumental in winning that race for a number of reasons. One is during the race he's setting records and breaking his own record during the race, but he's doing it in a car that he made happen. Carroll Shelby was very vocal with the fact that Ken Miles was an amazing tester and, and he made that car what it was. So anyway, Ken got cheated. I'm sticking to that. 1967 little thing comes along called a GT500. We've all seen that, heard about it. It was a big block GT350. But in 66, 67, the first body style of a Mustang, you could not fit a big block in it. A 260, 289 was actually a pretty snug fit in the first gen Mustang. 67, 68, we do what all American car companies do with every car that becomes popular. We make it bigger and fatter. That's what happens. I don't know why. But in 67, it wasn't too bad. Unfortunately, it made it big enough to fit the FE series engines in it. 
427, 428, and the 390. So that's why we could have a GT500. Most of those were uh, 428 cars. Big deal. Now, I want to be clear. If this stuff didn't happen, Carroll Shelby is just some guy that won Le Mans 59 and had a bad heart. Because this happened, he's a guy that gets involved and makes that happen. He's a guy that comes up with this. He's a guy that Lee Iacocca says, let's go racing with this thing and so on. So they're into, obviously, road racing. We'll talk about a little series called the Trans Am Racing Series in a second. But the Boss 302 comes along because Ford wants to road race because that's a big deal in the 60s, right? So a little thing called the Boss 302. One of the coolest Mustangs ever made. I'm a little prejudiced. Had a 70 Boss 302. Absolutely loved that car. Had it in a lot of different trims and fit figurations over the time I had it. But anyway, <clears throat> in the road racing world, that was a very accomplished car also. Okay, so here okay. we go. Let's talk about this. Trans Am. We all know what that is. It's changed a lot over the years. What it started out as, the Trans Am Racing Series, was kind of like stock car racing. It was a, a stock body, stock suspension, obviously heavily modified. Uh, there was a 302 inch or five liter engine limit on it. All the factories were in it. It was a big deal. It started in 66, Ford won it in 66 and 67. Autry and Welch were driving a Mustang in 66. Jerry Titus won it in 67. Of course, the great Parnelli Jones won it in 1970 in a Boss 302. So all this stuff is defining the Mustang as a pony car. And again, it was performance was put into that car because of Carroll Shelby, Lee Iacocca, and that uh, arrangement. So that's why these came along. Hear me out. If there was no Mustang cleaning house on the drag strips and cleaning house and road racing, Chevrolet wouldn't have said, we need something for the Mustang. They may have came up with something because it was the muscle car era and so on, but guys, these are pony cars. So let's talk about this timeline a little bit. <clears throat> Barracuda came out in 64. It actually was a couple of weeks before the Mustang. Like the Mustang, did not start off as a performance car, but obviously became one later. Camaro came out in September of 66. I want to be clear. This, as you can see, is after that, is after that, is after that, is after that. You get my point. Um, then they wanted to go road racing because they wanted to be in the Trans Am series. So late 66, December 66, they came out with the Z28. That had a 302 in it. It was 67, 68, and 69 with a 302. Firebird came out in 67, which is Pontiac's. Camaro, kind of, right? And the AMX and the Javelin came out in 68 with American Motors stab at it. Uh, Chrysler had the uh, Challenger, maybe the Dodge, sorry guys. Uh, and then the Trans Am came out in 1969, which of course is an iteration of the Firebird. Now I want to make something clear about the Trans Am. This is kind of interesting. This was obviously named after that racing series. These guys raced in the Trans Am series with a Boss 302. These guys raced in the Trans Am series with a 302 inch Z28 Camaro. These guys never made a streetcar package with a 302 engine. So they kind of had the name, didn't play the game. I mean, they obviously raced in that series, but it wasn't with a package that came in the streetcars. Big kudos to Ford and to GM for having the Boss 302, having the Z28, and making a pretty killer package for the street. Hey, let's talk about the Dodge years. So, Lee Iacocca and Carroll Shelby are still friends from way back then. Lee Iacocca and Henry Ford II are not friends anymore. Mid-70s, 74, 75, I believe, Henry Ford II fired Lee Iacocca like they fell out of love big time. So, Lee Iacocca's looking for a job. About that time, Chrysler's trying to figure out how to get right side up, because they weren't. They were belly up. They borrowed a lot of money from the United States government. They had a bazillion unsold cars, and it was just bad business gone bad. So Lee Iacocca takes the reins, did amazing things with Chrysler in that time, got them back on their feet, got them profitable. Lee Iacocca's first book goes into that in detail. It's, it's really interesting. Because other than that, there ain't much to talk about in the car world 
in the 70s if you're talking about interesting good stuff that happened in performance. Most of the cars then were pretty sleepy. So let's get to the 80s because that's when some more good stuff happens as you know. Lee Iacocca has fixed Chrysler. They've got some money to spend. Iacocca wants to drive the brand. How do you drive the brand? With performance. Who do you drive the brand with? Some guy that had a bad heart, won Le Mans, and did all this cool stuff. So Carol Shelby, Lee Iacocca come together. Wasn't as grand as what happened in the Ford years, but none of this would have happened without the Cobra, as I've been saying. So Chrysler Dodge years, I believe they're 83 to 87. There was a Dakota truck that got Shelby eyes in 89. Uh, I did some research on that and I couldn't really find exact numbers. If I'm off on that, guys, I'm sorry, but you get the idea. They had a lot of turbo cars that they pushed the envelope on. There weren't a lot of turbo factory cars back then. Another thing that Carroll Shelby drove was turbocharger development. And, you know, these were four cylinder cars, little front wheel drive, squeaky car, but he did a lot of stuff with them. They were, they were fun little cars. Because of this, Something comes out called the Viper, but before that happens, this heart thing comes back. And Carol Shelby's heart, he's been suffering with it all those years. As you know, he had to quit driving because of it. But 1990, he got a new heart. Poor guy at a gambling table in Las Vegas literally dropped dead of a brain aneurysm. Horrible thing for him and his family. Uh, became a very fortunate thing, of course, for Carol Shelby. And he lived 22 years with that heart. I believe that's one of the longest surviving uh, heart recipients. So he's alive and well at that point, and they come out with a thing called a Viper. They never said it out loud, but the Viper was clearly a modern iteration of the AC Cobra. A big engine in the front of the car, little tiny car, no roof. Yes, the first year or so had no roof on it. And there it was. Everyone was surprised that they were able to get away with it in the day and age that we were in. And all of us, all of us hot rodders that were around then remember the first time we saw a Viper on the street because we looked at it and pointed at it and we thought, that's pretty cool. There's kind of a supercar around again. So again, without this timeline, this isn't happening. Then you have the Fox body. I mean, there's no Cobra. There's no Mustang, there's no Carroll Shelby, there's no Fox body. The performance car you drive today, if it was made after 1982, it owed something to the Fox body because that brought a performance car back to America. The Fox body aftermarket was a multi-billion dollar industry to say the least. So, you know, that went on to then Ford and Carroll Shelby and Shelby American partnering with Ford again. Now, of course, there's a GT350 again. There's a GT500. And we're living happy with hot rods. Without Carroll Shelby, who became Carroll Shelby because of the Cobra, I don't think most of that stuff would have happened, guys. So there you go. Hopefully, I've made my case that we should have an official Cobra Appreciation Day. I'm picking April 27th. Get it? Ford 27. I've got down here pending because it is pending. I sent the paperwork into a company that does National Appreciation Day, not a federal holiday, obviously, but kind of stating my case on it. I stated my case to you. What do you guys think? Thanks for watching Pete Snake Bike Kit. I'll see you on the next one.